This video was made possible thanks to your support on Patreon. Subscribe on Patreon for early access to videos and additional content. London in the Victorian era was far from the glamorous, picturesque capital city that we know today. It was a cluster of new developments aimed at the wealthy and overcrowded hovels in which the lower classes were subject to the grimmest conditions, without proper hygiene and with poor sanitation. This grisly backdrop provided the perfect cover for many of the city's most brutal killers, whose crimes went unpunished and whose victims have largely been forgotten across the passage of time. In today's episode, we'll be shedding light on two heinous unsolved cases from Victorian era London. But first, I want to thank Redecor for sponsoring today's episode. The world around us moves at breakneck speeds. We are going so fast from one thing to the next, we rarely have time to stop and smell the roses, to take a closer look at our surroundings and appreciate what's there. One way in which we've increased our relaxed focus on improving our surroundings has actually been through an incredibly unique game and interior design simulator called Redecor, who are the sponsors of today's episode. Available now on Android and iOS, you can download it for free in the description of this video to start creating unique designs and styling photorealistic rooms. Easily the best part about Redecor is its relaxing properties and infinite opportunities to grow your creative spirit and how you think about design. It is the perfect chance to learn about the world of interior deco and challenge yourself in imaginative ways you never thought were possible. Not only that, but Redecor can introduce you to a wonderful community of fellow designers, ranging from fellow amateurs to deco professionals. It really does feel like more than just a game, but also a way to boost cognitive function and reconstruct worlds in ways only you could come up with. Have you ever thought about how you would redecorate the living room from the TV show Friends? Well, Redecor is now giving you the chance to style it however you want. From the comfort of your phone, give that iconic TV set a complete shift in mood to accommodate your vibe. I can't resist the idea of a red and black cold case theme, as well as moody light fixtures and plenty of colorful throw pillows to accent the room. And what better timing than coinciding with the Friends reunion? So if you want to tip into your true creative spirits and learn how to shape the world with your own unique vision, Download Redecor from the link below for Android and iOS. It's free to download and help support the channel at the same time. And now let's dive in to this week's mysteries. Harriet Buswell. 27-year-old mother of one, Harriet Buswell, was known to friends and acquaintances as a bright and charismatic young woman. She was fondly remembered for the way she would devote all her attention to whoever she was speaking to, making her a woman who garnered friends quickly and easily. Although charming and warm, Harriet did not have the easiest life. A single mother to an eight-year-old, she struggled to get steady work and pay her bills. She often engaged in sex work as a primary means to keep a roof over her head and food on the table. On Christmas Eve of 1872, Harriet visited the Alhambra Theatre, likely looking to gather some extra cash to pay off her bills. Among others, she owed both her doctor and her childminder. At the theatre, Harriet had dinner with an unidentified man. On their way home, they stopped at a greengrocer, purchasing oranges, apples, and nuts. When they arrived at the 27-year-old's boarding house on Karam Street, the landlady let them in. The man headed straight upstairs, while Harriet remained downstairs, 
where she had a drink with her landlady before joining her guest. The following day, Harriet did not leave her room. Concerned, her landlady went to check on her, but the door was locked and nobody answered. Growing all the more worried, the landlady had the door broken down, only to find a gruesome scene that would stay with her for the rest of her life. Harriet was lying in her bed, lying among blood-soaked sheets. Her throat had been cut in two places, once below her left ear and once to the left side of her windpipe. There was a bloody thumbprint on her forehead. When authorities arrived on the scene, they were overwhelmed by the grisly nature of the crime, but they did their best to get to work. They reported that the 27-year-old's face looked peaceful despite the brutality of her murder. They also noted that her nightwear had not been disturbed. Harriet's door had been locked from the outside and there was no sign of a key, suggesting that the perpetrator had taken it with him when he left, although there was no blood anywhere near the door. Witnesses said they heard the man leave around 6.30 that morning. There were several pieces of physical evidence left behind at the crime scene. A bloody towel was found near the wash basin, indicating that the culprit had washed his hands and possibly the murder weapon before leaving. An apple had been left on the bedside table with a single bite taken out of it. Harriet's autopsy, however, found no trace of the apple in her stomach contents. Authorities deduced that the motive was robbery because the 27-year-old's purse, along with some jewelry and a pawn ticket, were missing from her room. Upon speaking with witnesses, police slowly began to build a picture of the suspect. Observers described the man Harriet had brought home as a foreigner, most likely German. His clothing was also recounted in great detail, while another onlooker called the man a rough-looking laborer. Despite the numerous witnesses who came forward in the case, police were unable to track down the man who was seen with Harriet that night. They looked over all the 27-year-old's correspondence and spoke with everyone she had contact with, not just at the time of the murder, but also those who she'd known or spoken with in the years before. The government offered a 200 pound reward for anyone with information that could lead to an arrest and a successful conviction but this incentive brought forward no successful leads. At some point during the initial investigation, authorities found a knife which they believed was the murder weapon, but it is unclear if it was ever confirmed to be so. While the investigation went on, the police also received letters from across Europe with writers detailing their suspicions about questionable foreigners. While many of these leads were followed, they all proved fruitless. In the media, Harriet's case was dubbed the Great Coram Street Murder. Then, in January of 1873, an arrest was made. Using the witness accounts given by the green grocer who'd served Harriet and her companion on the night of her murder, and by a waiter who'd served her earlier at the theater, authorities tracked down a man named Dr. Henry James Bernard Hessel, a minister who was in the process of migrating with a group of Germans to South America. The doctor was positively identified by both of the witnesses as the man who was seen with Harriet on Christmas Eve. Reportedly, the doctor's ship had stopped for repairs in Ramsgate, Kent, and he'd traveled to London and had been in the city on the night of the crime. In court, his defense lawyer argued that Dr. Hessel was ill in bed, pointing out that his boots had remained outside of his door all night and that there were several witnesses who could corroborate his story. While authorities believed that this could be their man, the public thought otherwise. Dr. Hessel was a soft-spoken, well-educated, married clergyman. All attributes that people believed made him a respectable member of their society. The minds of the public did not change, not even when a maid came forward claiming that, just days after the murder, Dr. Hessel's wife had given her several bloody handkerchiefs to wash, including one which was almost entirely blood-soaked. The maid also noted that on the day of his return from London, the doctor had requested turpentine and a clothes brush, 
although he argued in court this was because he'd accidentally gotten paint on his wife's dress. Ultimately, the magistrate freed Dr. Hessel, insisting upon his innocence and convinced of his good character. In more recent decades, it has come to light that the doctor was a ship's chaplain because he had been discharged from his congregation for alcohol abuse and for running up heavy debts. Although none of this made him a murderer, it certainly made him a less upstanding citizen in the eyes of the public. If this information had been known in the 1870s, it seems likely he would have been subject to much more scrutiny. Harriet's body was claimed by her brother and buried, although it is unknown where. It is also unknown what became of her eight-year-old daughter. In the years following Dr. Hessel's release, authorities attempted to find answers and close the case for good, but they were all unsuccessful. The case was never closed, and Harriet's murder remains unsolved. Matilda Hacker One of London's most well-known Victorian era cases is that of Matilda Hacker. Her case was heavily covered in newspapers at the time and turned into a media circus filled with scandal and secrets. But despite being so heavily sensationalized and gossiped about, the case of Matilda Hacker is still unsolved. Born in 1811, in Canterbury, to a talented stonemason and his wife, Matilda Hacker grew up living a life of luxury. Her father quickly established himself in their town, and his skills were often sought after. As a result, his wealth grew, and the money came steadily when he began to build a small property empire. Matilda had two other siblings, a brother named Edward and a sister named Amelia, who was three years younger than her. Amelia and Matilda were known to be inseparable, and their bond did not waver even as they entered adulthood. Both women refused to marry or settle down, and were known for their carefree attitudes and their eccentric clothing choices. The pair were practically famous for choosing to wear bold colors and strong patterns, both of which were considered outlandish at the time. Even into her old age, Matilda continued to dye her hair auburn, wearing it in ringlets, a style choice that was often mocked by her peers. After their father's death, the children lived comfortably from the money they made renting out the rooms of the family home in Winchip. However, Matilda's lust for life began to wane when Amelia died suddenly in 1871. The 60-year-old became reclusive and began to refuse to pay for the upkeep of the family property, as well as several other bills. She entirely neglected her role as a landlady, forcing tenants to contact her brother, Edward. Subsequently, Matilda spent time in jail for refusing to pay her debts. Afterwards, instead of changing her ways, she chose to move around frequently, using different aliases in an attempt to avoid colliding once again with law enforcement. She was eventually caught in London and forced to clear her debts. Then, in 1877, she moved into a room in a three-story townhouse in Euston Square, Bloomsbury, under the name of Miss Ewish. The townhouse was owned by Severin Bastendorf, who was originally from Luxembourg, and his London-born wife, Mary. Severin had a booming business as a cabinet maker, where he employed several of his siblings, and the couple had four children. They reportedly lived a comfortable life, and the remaining rooms in the home that the family did not use were rented out to lodgers. On May 9th of 1879, a young teenage errand boy was digging out coal from the basement of the Bastendorf's townhouse in preparation for the arrival of a new tenant, who requested to use the basement to store his fuel. Upon digging, the boy was horrified to find a human foot. Alarmed, he notified the family. When they dug further, they discovered the badly decomposed remains of a human, wrapped in an oilcloth. Authorities were quick to arrive on the scene. The doctor who'd accompanied the officers initially believed that the body had been there for years, given the rate of decomposition. The victim was missing one foot and had a cord wrapped twice around their neck. The clothing on the body was almost entirely gone, 
but the presence of lace, a decorative brooch, and the remnants of a satin shawl indicated the victim was most likely a woman, and a wealthy one at that. She was believed to be between the ages of 55 and 60, and had been dead for one to three years. Patches of auburn hair and several of her teeth still remained intact. At the inquest, the Bastendorf family explained that the cellar was almost never cleared out, and that it had been on this occasion only because the new lodger had asked to use it. Both Severin and the family maid Sarah noted that they'd found bones in the basement, but that they had never thought anything of it. Severin explained that he didn't know the difference between animal bones and human ones, while Sarah told the inquest that she had shown the bone to Mary, who dismissed the notion that it was human, and insisted it must have been from the boar the family had eaten recently. Meanwhile, detectives began making inquiries to local dental offices, surmising that the elderly woman must have started the process of getting dentures, because she was obviously a lady who took care of herself and took pride in her appearance. One dentist, who had his office near Euston Square, stepped forward, telling authorities about a patient who'd been to see him about getting dentures two years prior. During this time, investigators also met a man named Edward Hacker, who suspected that the body belonged to his sister, Matilda. Edward told authorities about the gold watch that his sister always used to wear, and the accessory was tracked down to a local pawn shop. With the help of what little belongings had been found on her body and the color of her hair, Edward identified the victim in the cellar as Matilda. For some time, it was unclear what date Matilda had vanished, but eventually it was determined as being October 15th of 1877. She was known to have written a letter dated October 10th and reportedly left in a rush five days later. No one in the house could explain her departure and nobody witnessed it either, making the whole situation a rather murky one. It appeared as if Matilda had just up and vanished one day and nobody had thought anything of it because she was so often a short-term lodger. With Edwards positively identifying the body, the media began reporting on the story. More often than not, they spoke unkindly of Matilda and her unconventional lifestyle. In particular, they focused on her clothing and hair, with one newspaper referring both to Matilda and Amelia, writing, Notwithstanding their age, they insisted upon dressing in the style of girls of 18 and presented such a ridiculous appearance that they became the laughing stock of the street boys. The crime itself was dubbed the Euston Square Mystery by the press. It wasn't long after the identification that authorities got a huge break in the case. The pawnbroker who'd had Matilda's gold watch identified the Bastendorf family's former maid, a young woman named Hannah Dobbs, as the one who'd brought in the accessory. Originally from Devon, Hannah had lived a rather turbulent life, having multiple run-ins with law enforcement. At various points in her life, she had been found guilty of petty crimes, most of which involved theft. Not only was the maid reportedly responsible for pawning Matilda's watch, but she had also pawned several items of clothing. In both instances, she had used the name Rosina Bastendorf. She had left her position with the family around eight months before the body was found, in September of 1878, after Mary accused her of theft. Upon setting off from the Bastendorf family home, Hannah left behind several items of clothing and a pair of glasses, which were suspected of belonging to Matilda. She was also found to have given an empty, broken cash box to the Bastendorf children to play with. When she was asked about it by Severin, she explained that it was hers, but she'd lost the key and had to break it open. As a result, it was no longer any use. This cash box was also thought to have belonged to Matilda. During the inquest, it was also revealed that Hannah had been having an affair with Severin's brother, Peter, and had even, at one point, become pregnant with his child, although she eventually lost the baby. With the evidence mounting up against Hannah, it wasn't long before the inquest returned a verdict that said the 66-year-old had been murdered, and Hannah was the police's prime suspect. 
Her trial began in June of 1879, during which it was revealed that a stain found on the carpet in Matilda's room was actually blood. Shortly after Matilda's vanishing, Hannah had told Mary Bastendorf that the stain was due to a broken lamp. Doctors explained that the blood may have come from the 66-year-old's eyes or nose while being strangled. They also added that there was no evidence to suggest that the death was accidental or natural. Severin was questioned on the stand about his relationship with Hannah, although he denied all allegations and implications that he was involved with her romantically. The jury took 25 minutes to declare Hannah as not guilty, and she was acquitted of all charges. This verdict likely came because there was very little evidence against the young woman outside of her pawning some of Matilda's items. Also, while being questioned, Mary explained that on October 14th, Hannah was caring for the children. Hannah's defense lawyer ran with this, asking the jury how she could possibly have carried out the murder while looking off the four young kids. Although the trial was over, Hannah still had time to serve in prison for a conviction of petty theft. Once she was released, she went to a tabloid named the Illustrated Police News, determined to set the record straight. And with that, a whole new scandal emerged. According to Hannah, Severin had taken a liking to her shortly after she began to work for the family, and the couple engaged in an affair. The father of four even had her moved over to his part of the house so that she could work with him rather than underneath his wife. Before long, Hannah became pregnant with her employer's child. Severin agreed to pay for the baby's upkeep, but told her that she should begin an affair with Peter, his bachelor brother, and claimed that the baby was his, so nobody would get suspicious. Hannah started an affair with Peter while maintaining the one she had with Severin. Things in the Bastendorf household reportedly began to unravel from here. Hannah alleged that Severin had taken the life of a lodger with whom he'd become close friends. She said that she was given a man's watch and chain by Severin, and that she believed the two items belonged to that lodger, who suddenly went missing around the same time. As for Matilda, Hannah claimed that she had told Severin about the money and valuables contained in the elderly woman's room. She said that on October 14th, she had taken the children out for the day. Upon returning to the townhouse, Severin told her that Matilda had left to go to the countryside for a change of pace. A few days passed, and he gave her the gold watch and chain, the items that had belonged to the 66-year-old woman. Hannah then went on to tell the tabloid that she had later found Matilda's body, but had been told by Severin that she would look like the culprit if she told the authorities about it, because she was the one who had pawned the elderly woman's belongings. As a result, she was far too frightened to speak with the police. It is unclear how much of this story was Hannah's words, and how much of it has been sensationalized by the tabloids, who were not known for their independent, well-researched journalism. Severin and Mary publicly denied everything, but Severin was later found guilty of perjury because he had lied about his relationship with Hannah while in court under oath. He was sentenced to 12 months imprisonment with hard labor. Shortly after his release, his marriage disintegrated. In May of 1887, Severin was charged with being a, quote, lunatic under proper control after walking into a police station and shouting, I have been sent by almighty God to claim 50,000 pounds. My brother Peter and his wife murdered Miss Hacker. He had previously been committed to Colney Hatch Asylum after telling authorities he was hearing voices. His medical notes stated that he was paranoid and believed that God was talking to him. Severian eventually died in 1909, aged 62. Ultimately, no one was ever successfully convicted for Matilda's murder. The pamphlet written by Hannah has never been proven to be true or false. Peter Bastendorf later moved to Paris, while Hannah fell off the grid completely, causing many to suspect that she changed her name to avoid all the sensationalism that had accompanied the case. It is unknown if she and Peter ever reconciled. The case caused so much scandal, not just locally, but nationally, 
that the residents of Euston Square petitioned to have its name changed so that they could escape its bad reputation. It was changed to Ensley Gardens in 1880. Although many have forgotten the events that took place in the townhouse at Euston Square, those who do remember have a never-ending slew of questions that will likely never be answered. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon to have a chance to have your hometown featured in an upcoming Cold Case Detective video. Thank you for watching, stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.